everyone. And again, welcome to the Fruitsco, especially uh, the blueberry production series of it. We're going to have uh, six different sections and uh, 12 different speakers. Um, for today, uh, I'm planning to present some information on blueberry cultivar selection since um, this is the first um, thing a grower or a future grower needs to consider when deciding to plant some blueberries. So let me just uh, share some general information about blueberry cultivation in Alabama. Uh, we all know that blueberries are a high value fruit crop that is becoming very popular, not only in our nation, but worldwide. And with that, um, according to the 2017 census data, Alabama's blueberry farm gate value has increased recently. And right now, or right in 2017, we had 536 blueberry farms and 834 acres planted with uh, blueberries in Alabama. But um, you're probably aware that there are different types of blueberries and uh, the one that is wide, widely popular and widely grown in Alabama uh, is called rabbit eye blueberry or vaccinia machiae. And there are different uh, good reasons for that. Uh, the first one, this plant is native to the southeastern United States. Uh, bushes are very vigorous and productive. They are long leaf and uh, very easy to care. They are also drought tolerant, uh, which is not the case with, uh, let's say, some southern high bushes. Also, they can grow uh, successfully in lower organic matter soils. And uh, that, that is the prevalent type of soils that we have in the state of Alabama. Uh, usually, uh, the organic, good organic matter uh, would be around 2%, but especially in the uh, eastern part, southeast part of the state, uh, many farms um, are showing about only half, half percent of organic matter in their soils. So to amend the soil for um, production of southern high bushes, uh, it will require a lot of amendments, a big investment. But uh, rabbit eyes can go by if the organic matter in the soil is around 2%. They are also uh, possessing a high uh, nutraceutical value and a lot of health benefits are related to uh, blueberry consumption. And uh, that is because um, the antioxidants can fight the free radicals. Uh, so there are um, benefits for um, controlling some cardiovascular diseases um, and some cancers and a lot of other benefits to your health. Also, uh, rabbit eyes are very versatile. They can be uh, consumed fresh. Um, they could be frozen um, for later use. And they could be processed in different juices and jellies and gems, and they're just a nice crop. With that, uh, what we need to consider when, when we uh, start our uh, cultivar selection. Uh, again, uh, the most important uh, thing when a grower decides to plant some blueberries. First of all, we need to consider uh, our location in the state and what is our climate and especially uh, what is the USDA um, zone, climatic zone, um, hardiness uh, zone in Alabama where we live and going to plant those blueberries. So being aware of our climate, uh, because we will need to match um, our climate with the biology, the biology of the cultivars that we're going to grow. The second important thing uh, would include the uh, soil conditions. And of course, this relates to the soil pH, which um, uh, blueberries uh, usually require a pH that is more on the acidic side, somewhere between 4.5 to 5.2 um, 
pH and also, as I mentioned, the organic matter uh, in the soil also is important, but uh, rabbit eyes will go by uh, when the organic matter is about 2%. Also, uh, it's important to have your marketing strategy before you plant your uh, blueberry bushes. And um, considering if you are going to have pick your own operation or a big commercial operation and how you are going to uh, harvest uh, your, uh, your crop every year, all those are important factors that need to be matched to the plant biology. And uh, recently, uh, the chilling hour requirements that each cultivar is needing uh, for proper uh, development in the spring and for proper, proper uh, crop production are becoming more and more important, uh, especially with the warming trends in the climate that we're uh, seeing in uh, some of the last winter seasons. So, um, we need to be uh, aware of when our plants are going to bloom. Um, if the bloom happens very early in the season, the risk of freeze and frost damage is usually increased. And then uh, for marketing purposes, um, when um, our crop is going to ripe, we need to be aware of that. What is the yield potential of each cultivar that we're selecting to plant uh, and how consistently the cultivar is cropping is also very important. And then we need to be aware of the fruit quality of the particular cultivar. Um, you probably uh, have harvested some blueberries already and you know that uh, at harvest, um, some of the stems, when we pick the blueberries, they're causing some cracks and this um, opening of the skin uh, is kind of inviting some uh, diseases to occur, uh, some secondary infections can happen, and the storage life of those blueberries uh, is being uh, much reduced. Uh, shipping qualities are also uh, are, are being reduced. Um, and there are other qualities like uh, the size and the number of the seeds. Um, also, some uh, consumers are looking at the darkness of the skin. Um, so a lot to consider. And again, the harvesting method, if you're going to have pick your own operation or uh, if you consider some uh, machine harvesting, then you need to look at some cultivars that are probably uh, going to ripe, um, to have more concentrated ripening, so uh, less harvest during the season. Okay, um, as um, I have mentioned different um, requirements, uh, it is good to know that uh, we have a um, couple of breeding programs in the region, in the southeast, and uh, right now, um, for the last year, Auburn University um, were very uh, happy to welcome uh, Dr. Sushan Ru, who is our um, blueberry, new blueberry breeder, and we also have another colleague, Dr. Uh, Melba Salazar, uh, who is our blueberry uh, plant physiologist. So with their help, we hope that very soon um, we're going to have some uh, new selections with uh, highly desirable traits for advanced testing in different locations in Alabama. Um, but for now, we needed to test some of the UGA uh, developed and released cultivars that uh, we did not have information about their performance uh, in, in our climate uh, before. And some of them include uh, the cultivar O'Clockney that was released in 2002, Vernon was released in 2004, and recently uh, the breeding program uh, from the University of Georgia released two um, large fruited rabbit eye cultivars, and those are Titan and Crewer. So we didn't have information on their performance in our states. Um, and my talk today is going to uh, 
present some of the research done so far. We also uh, were looking at an interesting uh, USDA release that is called Pink Lemonade, and is it is recommended for homeowners mainly, not for commercial production. But because of the wonderful qualities, we wanted to look at the performance of this cultivar in Alabama as well. So uh, today I'm going to present the results uh, and trying to summarize the information from two studies conducted in two different locations uh, in Alabama. Uh, the first of the studies was initiated uh, in, in uh, 2011, and it was conducted in North Alabama, our um, North Alabama Horticulture Research uh, Center in Kalman. Uh, we had um, rooted plants uh, from the breeder at the University of Georgia. Uh, he gave us for testing five um, of the recently released cultivars and uh, five of his advanced selections. They were potted and grown until they became three years old. And then uh, we are assessing the cultivar response to the growing conditions in North Alabama. Here is the list of the cultivar, uh, cultivars that we received from Georgia. And first of them, uh, it was uh, still unnamed um, selection. Uh, T959, uh, and now it's the released cultivar Titan. Then we had Vernon, Oklokne, Alapaha, Brightwell, and five more selections that were not considered for release by the breeder. And here you can, uh, the picture, you can see uh, the crew at the station uh, helping to plant those, those bushes. So we were uh, evaluating uh, everything um, in terms of biological, in, in order to kind of determine the biological requirements for those cultivars. And uh, of course, we start with uh, flowering progression. And um, we were uh, pleased to see that uh, this new cultivar, Alapaha, which has relatively early ripening, is actually having a very late um, blooming. What does, what does it, this mean like in years like uh, this last season uh, when there is a big risk of frost and uh, freeze damage, um, this cultivar can escape some uh, to some extent, at least, um, uh, the damage uh, to the flowers and can produce uh, some decent crop. Also, as I mentioned, it's important to determine uh, what is the season of ripening of all those uh, cultivars. And um, we can see from uh, this chart that uh, our Alapaha, Titan, and Vernon cultivars, they all started to ripen in mid-June in our North Alabama location. And uh, before then, we had three of the selections with uh, very early ripening, but again, uh, none of them got released by the breeder. And um, we um, were interested if the season could be a little bit extended, season of ripening. Uh, so we had Brightwell and Clockney uh, that uh, really uh, started to ripen uh, very late. Uh, the most important quality of uh, any cultivar is uh, the cropping potential or the yield that the cultivar would uh, produce. And um, not surprisingly, uh, here uh, for those three years, um, the yield per plant is being uh, presented on this chart, and we can see that uh, Titan was the cultivar that is producing the highest yield. And uh, it was followed by Vernon and Alapaha and also Brightwell. So all those cultivars produced a very good to excellent yield throughout the years. Oklopni here was an exception, and this was a surprise to us as the breeder is, describes this cultivar with being highly productive. But um, one of the reasons for this to happen may have been um, 
the proximity to our pollinizer. Uh, usually, a Glopni uh, needs a good pollinizer, and powder blue is being recommended as the companion cultivar for a Glopni. And since we had this in another study that was nearby, and we wanted to save on, um, on some uh, space uh, to plant more of the newer selections and test them, uh, we relied on this uh, pollinizer, but uh, probably part of the problem was uh, the lack of good pollination for a clock knee. Um, this chart represents uh, the yield data uh, for the years uh, starting in 2013 uh, to 2017, when actually uh, the station in Kalman uh, got closed and we couldn't collect any more data on the performance of those plants. But you can see that in general, the same tendency uh, of cropping uh, was confirmed for uh, the five years uh, period. Uh, like um, Alapaha was uh, number one producer with 46 uh, pounds per plant cumulative yield for those five years. And it was followed by Titan and Brightwell with um, virtually uh, the same type of um, total yield produced. Uh, Vernon uh, was also um, a good producer. Uh, again, a clockney um, was the, provided the, the lowest uh, crop. I mentioned that uh, uh, especially Titan here was introduced and tested because of the size of the fruit that was reported by the breeder to reach about uh, three and a half, four grams on average while a, norm, uh, a typical uh, blueberry would produce uh, an average uh, fruit size of about two grams only. Uh, so um, we can see from this chart that Titan uh, really had the largest fruit throughout the study and it reached um, about three and a half grams on average. And it was followed by um, the fruit size of Vernon, uh, which also produced average fruit size of about two and a half grams. Alapaha uh, was um, producing the smallest berries, but of course, being an early season cultivar, this is pretty typical for uh, the early season cultivars. So to summarize some of our impressions uh, from the study in North Alabama, uh, we saw that um, Alapaha really had a late blooming, even though uh, it ripened early uh, with, with climax. Uh, and uh, Alapaha has about 450 to 550 chilling hour requirements. Uh, this is a very good cultivar because it can help to avoid or at least to reduce the risk of freeze, um, of spring freeze and frost damage. And uh, we might be able to see this uh, this year uh, very clearly in another study. Um, so Alapaha has this early ripening, uh, which means you can get a higher premium price for the fruit. Um, also, the fruit is um, small to medium size, uh, but otherwise delicious. Alapaha is the high, highly productive cultivar uh, as obvious from this study. Uh, the second cultivar we were interested in was Titan. Titan has uh, between 500 to 550 chilling hour requirements. It is also an early season ripening variety with uh, very large berry size, the largest uh, from uh, this test in comparison to the other 10 cultivars. Um, Titan uh, has excellent, Titan fruit has excellent firmness, but um, the fruit has a tendency to crack when the conditions are kind of wet. So uh, if the season is rainy, uh, you can expect the, those cracks, unless it is grown in uh, some type of protected environment. Uh, probably a lot of the fruit will crack. Um, Titan has this, um, type of vigorous and healthy plant, 
and is highly productive in North Alabama. So what we saw for Vernon, that is um, having like between 500 and 550 chilling hours. Um, it has also vigorous plant um, with moderately spreading um, habit, growing habit. Uh, it has early season ripening with relatively large size berries, of course, smaller than Titan, but uh, still pretty good size. Um, the flavor uh, is excellent, uh, nice color and nice firmness for Vernon. Buclockney is the cultivar among this group that requires um, the highest number of chilling hours uh, to um, develop and produce a good crop. It is a late season ripening rabbit eye cultivar uh, with uh, vigorous and upright plants. But um, in this experiment in North Alabama, um, the productivity was uh, relatively low and it was the lowest among all cultivars that we tested there. Uh, of course, one of the reasons uh, that we think of this uh, providing this low, low productivity was the proximity of the uh, powder blue uh, is a companion cultivar. Um, it wasn't planted directly in the uh, adjacent rows. It was planted in an adjacent planting. So uh, to summarize our impressions from um, this trial, uh, we saw that during the initial years of establishment, cultivars Alapaha, uh, Titan, and Vernon produced high yields. Uh, Titan had the largest berries, uh, about three and a half grams on average. Vernon also produced large berries of over two and a half grams. Alapaha matured very early, even though in flower, it flowered late. So with that, I'm going to transition to a newer uh, experiment that we're recently conducting in central Alabama. Uh, it is again based on three-year-old potted plants that were uh, planted at the Chiltern Research and Extension Center in 2019. And this experiment is grown under conventional production system. The cultivars that we're testing here uh, include Alapaha, Climax, Premier, uh, Crewer, Titan, Vernon, Teeth Blue, Powder Blue, O'Clockney, and this pink lemonade that you can see on the picture. So in 2020, we uh, let the plants grow and establish their um, root system. We allowed just a few uh, berries on the plants. Uh, we kind of thinned out uh, almost all of the fruit, um, kind of focusing on the development of a good um, root system during this period of time. So we did not collect data on yield in uh, 2020. But um, um, we started monitoring um, for the season to determine the season of ripening and some uh, fruit quality data. So um, in 2021, we collected the, food, the full uh, set of, um, of data for all those cultivars. Uh, what we noticed, uh, Alapaha, Vernon, Crewer, and Premier uh, started to ripen about 10 to 15 days earlier uh, here in central Alabama in comparison to our North Alabama location. And then um, Climax, Titan, and Pink Lemonade, uh, they started their ripening about five days uh, later after the first group of cultivars. And uh, finally, we had uh, a group of uh, late season cultivars that included uh, Powder Blue, Teeth Blue, and Clockney and uh, they started ripening about two weeks after the initial ripening um, was recorded for the first set of cultivars. Here is our data for the total yield per plant in 2021 or the last season. Uh, we can see um, just in controversy to what we saw in North Alabama, 
our clockney plants here uh, were the uh, highest, provided the highest yield of 8.6 um, pounds per plant on average. And then we had teeth blue and powder blue producing 7.3 kilograms per plant on average. And um, Kruger and Alapaha uh, had between five and a half to six uh, kilograms per plant. Um, what was uh, our surprise here was to see that Titan produced really a very low yield. But part of it might have been uh, that we got a lot of rain during uh, this uh, ripening season and a lot of Titan's berries uh, have cracked. So they considered them unmarketable. We didn't harvest them. We did not report on uh, the yield for them. So this was the marketable yield that we were getting from Titan uh, in this last season uh, in central Alabama. And uh, not surprisingly, pink lemonade had also a very low crop. So here is our data for the mean berry size for the last two seasons. And uh, you can see that uh, Kruger and Titan uh, were um, producing the largest fruit in both seasons. And um, our Alapaha and uh, pink lemonade um, kind of consistently uh, had those uh, smaller fruit size. It is also important to look at uh, the sweetness of the fruit. And uh, in both seasons, uh, teeth blue uh, provided the sweetest fruit uh, in our central Alabama location. And uh, it is also worth to, to notice that 2021, uh, we had this rainy, um, rainy season, uh, rain, rainy summer, and uh, probably this contributed to um, the lower uh, sugars that we saw in the berries um, in general in 2021. Some of the conclusions, of course, this study just uh, almost just started and uh, we need uh, to evaluate uh, the fruit and the quality in uh, multiple seasons. But um, our initial impressions from Alapaha are kind of confirming our um, conclusions from the study in North Alabama. Uh, since this plant had a very similar performance, uh, very a uh, very good cultivar, great producer. Titan, um, we noticed the last season at least uh, in central Alabama was not as productive as those plants performed in North Alabama. Vernon uh, produced um, better crop than Titan in the central Alabama location. And Uklopni, uh, surprisingly for us, had the highest yield in central Alabama in comparison to all cultivars that we were evaluating there. So Kruger uh, is one of the newest, probably the newest um, rapid eye release from University of Georgia. Um, it has relatively low chilling hour requirements um, between 350 and 400 chili hours are required. Um, ripening is early season for Kruger. Um, berry size is really uh, very large, um, very similar to Titan. Um, better fruit firmness um, than uh, probably than Titan. And the plants are vigorous and uh, highly productive. Um, the seeds inside, though, are a little larger. Uh, and um, the next cultivar I wanted to highlight, this is the pink lemonade, which is a very attractive, a very unique uh, pink color. Um, but again, this cultivar has relatively low chilling requirements uh, between two and 300 only. Uh, the size of the fruit is relatively small. Um, in central Alabama, uh, this cultivar ripened uh, in the middle of the season, even though uh, the literature suggests it, is, it has uh, late ripening. 
but it's in some other environments. Um, so the yield for us was uh, very low. Uh, this is the major reason why it's not recommended for commercial production, maybe. But the taste is very distinct, and you can see the appearance is very attractive. Uh, those berries, once they uh, start ripening, they can soften really, really very fast. Um, but what you can do, you can um, harvest them with some fruit that is not completely ripe. And the taste is your amount, uh, the feeling is real, real good. So talking about the biology of the plants and our environment and why we need to match the plant biology with our um, location and the conditions in our location. Probably uh, those pictures that I'm going to show you and the story I'm going to tell you from this last season is going to explain why it is so important. But uh, what you are looking at on this screen, we're having some crewer plants. I mentioned that crewer requires between 350 and 400 chilling hours for uh, successful development and crop production. And um, you can see on the first picture on January 11 of this year, um, so early in the season, uh, those flowers were open and we had about 30 to 40 percent on different plants of the flowers already open in um, beginning of January. We had this um, unusually warm December, um, warm for, for a winter month, but uh, still uh, had those temperatures that uh, help to accumulate and satisfy uh, the chilling requirements for this cultivar. Uh, so when um, January came, the cultivar was ready to uh, open its flowers. And a month later, you can see how those plants were looking. We had close to 80% of the flowers open, but uh, we are well aware that the risk of frost and freeze events in Alabama uh, expires in mid-April. So we were really worrying what is going to happen to our plants, especially uh, with cultivars like crewer that kind of bloomed that early. And by the way, flowering for blueberry plants was earlier than usual for the entire southeastern region this year. But just um, to compare with some other cultivars, um, you can see on this picture that climax buds were uh, either completely closed or just starting to swell. So um, we are aware that this plant phenology is uh, closely related to the environmental factors and we're um, pretty aware that if the bud is um, still dormant, like this one, um, any freeze wouldn't have any effect on the buds. At this stage, probably, uh, if 21 degrees Fahrenheit temperature uh, can, um, can happen, can occur, uh, there will be uh, some damage to the buds. Um, but, um, it was early January and those plants um, um, were, were developing relatively fast, even though um, climax was behind, uh, behind uh, crewer. So in January uh, and February, we're experiencing some um, freezing temperatures. So we decided to cover our plants. We have four rows of blueberries at this location, and uh, those are our row covers we use to protect the plants. Um, by the way, the literature says that if you use a single layer of uh, row covers, it can increase the temperature beneath by about uh, two degrees. If you use like double layer of row covers, the temperature inside could be uh, increased by 8 to 10 degrees. 
and when we measured the temperature outside and inside, we saw like eight degrees difference um, for the plants that were covered with uh, those raw covers. Also, we tried to keep the soil moist, as moist as possible, uh, to try to protect uh, our plants. But um, we're, we're aware that individual flowers, uh, when the individual flowers are distinguishable, they could be killed at temperature of 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And when the flowers are separated with their corollas closed, they could be killed at 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Fully open flowers, like you saw for February uh, um, development of Kruger, they could be damaged at 29 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And um, if you'd like more uh, information about the plant phys uh, phenology and um, uh, risk temperatures, uh, you can look at this publication um, that uh, is from the Alabama Cooperative Extension uh, System. So what happened on March 11 and 12 of this year, uh, the temperatures in this central Alabama location, they went to 24 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, as you can imagine, uh, uh, those blueberry plants that were very advanced in their development and had fully open flowers, um, they were they were severely severely damaged. Unfortunately, uh, those plants um, were covered uh, before the event, of course, but two of the rows, um, they were blown by, the covers were blown by the wind. So uh, as a consequence, we saw difference in the responses of Kruger and other cultivars after the freeze event on March 15th. And here, um, those pictures uh, would demonstrate to you how the uncovered two rows of uh, plants were looking in comparison uh, with the plants that were protected um, during this time that still have some surviving crop and they might produce some crop this year. Um, so this is a very good example of um, the use of some um, protective environment for the production, especially uh, for those cultivars that have low chilling requirements. And here uh, I'm representing uh, the data for cold damage based on uh, the two rows uh, that were covered. Uh, and uh, those bars that are in green, they represent the covered um, cultivars that um, have some more uh, higher percent survivability of their flower buds and their fruit. And uh, uh, the purple um, bars here, they represent the averages for the plants that were not covered, where, where the cover was actually blown by the wind. And um, you can see from this picture that our Oclockne and Thief Blue cultivars uh, had the highest percent survivability, uh, but we also had Kruger and Climax and Alapaha that, um, that might have like 30 to 40% um, of their flowers and fruit uh, surviving these conditions. While uh, for Climax and um, Alapaha and powder blue that were without the cover, actually, um, the percentage of damage is 100% um, 100, 100 loss of crop. So this is um, kind of underlying the significance of knowing the plant biology and, and the conditions in your area. To summarize this information, probably we would not recommend uh, planting of crewer plants in central Alabama unless they're under some type of protective environment like a greenhouse or, um, or some other uh, protection uh, because of their early satisfaction of chilling requirements, early bloom and, um, um, and the damage caused by, by the freeze uh, events. 
um, trials will continue to determine the, the best performing gravidite blueberry cultivars for sustainable production in var various environmental conditions in the state. And uh, with that, I wanted to acknowledge the assistance of um, uh, Matty Price, who is in the team at the uh, research station, uh, station at Chilton, and also um, Arnold Kaler, who is now retired, but the entire team at the station in Coleman, uh, who uh, helped to collect data and conduct those studies. And also uh, the study um, is conducted with uh, the support of uh, specialty crop law grants of the Alabama uh, Department of Agriculture and Industry.